Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, my, my colleague, uh, Deputy Dennis Nocton and Kite Niola, who have done a huge amount of work in relation to this area. And uh, Without doubt, Minister, long COVID is here to stay, it looks like, and it is an absolute uh, medical syndrome, and there's no doubt beyond that now. And as I say, it is very hard to see um, where the treatment regimes are going, but we have to build a comprehensive service now in place uh, to, to try and look after people who have been infected. And uh, just as importantly, we have to try and look at mitigating uh, people contracting COVID and the effects of uh, long COVID. And I suppose uh, we've had a lot of anecdotal information in terms of the healthcare space and the educational sector which have both been heavily impacted and at the start of COVID, uh, you know, we know full well that we had people working in very compromised environments and in actual fact it took us many, many months to recognise that COVID was an airborne disease despite the fact that all the evidence was there from the start and I would, uh, Deputy Murphy has asked for a review, I think we still need to go back and look at some of the um, actions that we took around uh, COVID at the very early stage. We missed an awful lot of tricks. We were very late to, to bring in uh, mitigating therapies. We didn't bring in antigen testing, which could have significantly helped uh, to reduce the amount of COVID infection uh, for nearly 18 months into the disease minister. And these points were never handled. Uh, but we basically now have a cohort of people in the country who are affected by long COVID. And we don't exactly know the numbers, but it could be anywhere between three and 5% of those who contract COVID. And that appears to be a figure that's going to keep recurring as people. You can get COVID and recover. You can get COVID subsequently and develop long COVID as a result. So we need to have a look at this uh, syndrome. And I'd like to applaud the work of Professor Lambert and what he is doing. And I would say, Minister, he gave a briefing in the AV room here some weeks ago. And what was, um, stood out very prominently was the lack of support that he is getting significant support from the department in terms of trying to push the initiatives that he has highlighted and I think that's very disappointing uh, from the government's uh, position. I think it's, it's fair to say that long COVID now is largely, it seems, centred around neurological uh, syndrome, uh, syndromes and immune responses and in that case it falls into the whole areas of MEE. Uh, fibromyalgia and other areas that we have people in the country who suffer and we haven't done enough for these patient cohorts uh, either. But I can think of a couple of patients um, of, long COVID, of long COVID and I would point out one health worker in Waterford, 52 years of age, a marathon runner uh, prior to contracting COVID who contracted COVID as a result of her work in the hospital and subsequently was off work for nearly five months, tried to go back to work, could barely climb the stairs, and she has now taken early retirement. And it's really, really unfortunate that, uh, you know, a, this has happened to her, and it, by dint of doing her job. And to that point, Minister, it seems uh, to me, as part of our motion, we are asking government to recognise long COVID as an occupational illness and, uh, and requiring a comprehensive special leave with pay scheme for frontline healthcare workers, as well as the expansion of services for other similar illnesses such as ME and chronic fatigue syndrome. And you know, this has already been recognised uh, by the EU, but I know it's up to each member state to ratify. But I would ask Minister, please, that you go and talk to colleagues at this stage. I think this is a small cohort of patients, ultimately, and they need to be given supports from the state, and they need to know that if they have long-term illness, that they can claim long-term disability for, for uh, COVID syndrome. And it, as you say, it is difficult to diagnose, but it's based on symptoms rather than, you can't do a blood test for long COVID, but you can certainly see uh, the symptoms that are, are resulting uh, from it. Um, so I think government needs to develop a far greater strategic action plan minister. And I know we have a number of, of COVID clinics in development around the country. And you've highlighted in your own statement there that right, they're not fully staffed, we're trying to get there. But I think we do need to understand that every hospital in the country is going to have to have some expertise in this area because you're going to have varying uh, degrees of, of symptoms. Some people are going to require a uh, very significant interaction with consultants, some less so, but uh, there is a good bit of work going on. And I would like to point out to you, Minister, just one thing which is in relation to vitamin D. And we had uh, anecdotal research going on out in Connolly Hospital for the past two years. It was actually brought into the Health Committee here over a year ago, showing the potential mitigating benefits of people supplementing vitamin D. 
quite a lot of work has been done and very, very significant statistical research has shown that the having high levels of vitamin D gives you a great amount of protection to the worst symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, that that uh, research was brought into the Health Committee, a report was generated. We could have gone and done a public health piece around supplementation of vitamin D. We could have uh, given people access to vitamin D uh, through uh, financial supports to try and help and we've done neither. And I think that's a great shame, uh, Minister. So look, I want to join with my colleagues in supporting this motion. I think we need to recognise the occupational injury that has been caused, Minister, and we need to do more to support patients and most especially the caregivers who are trying to develop the multidisciplinary teams uh, to deliver this.